We've seen two ways of handling embarrassingly parallel um, problems, um, job arrays and GNU parallel. But what if we want to reduce the time it takes for a single instance of a, um, of a problem? So here it takes about two seconds to solve uh, our pi estimator with the program we wrote to estimate pi. Let's say we want to reduce this, not just explore a larger set of parameters in the same uh, amount of time. To do that, we're going to have to think about coupled parallel problems. Everything we saw so far was totally independent. There was no communication needed between any of these instances of our pi solver. But now we start, need to start thinking about how to deal with a couple problem. Um, and again, we're going to use our, our pi estimator as an example. So let's take a look again at how that worked. So here's the idea. We were summing up the area of these green rectangles under a curve in order to estimate pi. So if we had, uh, and, and the way this works in a serial program is we simply calculate the area of the first rectangle, calculate the area of the second rectangle, add that area to the first, add the area of the third, add the area of the fourth, etc., until we're done. Now, let's think for a second about how we might parallelize this problem. How could we divide up the work across many cores uh, if we were, if we have many cores available. Well, the obvious thing to do is to allocate each of these area calculations to a different core. So process zero. So um, in this instance, we're going to talk about processes running on different cores. Uh, each process will run actually a copy of our calculate pi program but then the processes will work together to come up with a solution. So process zero running on the first CPU will calculate the area of the first rectangle. Process one will calculate the area of the second rectangle and so on. And once we have all of those areas calculated by each of the processes, they will all send their partial sums to process zero. And then process zero We'll add up those values and print the result. All right. And you notice that even though we have a lot more rectangles than we do processes, we can simply loop. So process zero will calculate this, um, this rectangle, and it's also going to calculate this rectangle and this rectangle. All right, so that's our strategy for taking this problem and dividing it up among different cores. To um, speed up our calculation of pi, we're going to use the message passing interface. Because the calculation of those different areas under the curve requires us to communicate the results of each area um, so they can be summed up at the end to get the total area under the curve, which is our estimation of pi, we're going to have to use something that supports passing of information between processes. So remember these processes are each running um, on a CPU, maybe on CPUs on different nodes, so they can all work together. The uh, message passing interface MPI libraries have been around for decades. This is an extremely common use case for high performance computing centers. And what they provide are standard commands for sharing information. In the midst of making this tutorial, I actually met with a user who is using MPI um, to perform an Anderson localization analysis of random networks. And so he uses many cores working together to do the linear algebra that he needs. And he uses exactly the tools that I'm going to show you to accomplish that. He uses Python and MPI for Pi. Most of our users, though, will be running programs like Orca that have the parallelization built into them under the hood. So the MPI is hidden from you. You don't have to write your own code in that case. But it's good to understand maybe what is happening, especially since running the program um, is often accomplished in the same way with the same MPI run commands that you'll see at the end of this tutorial. 
All right. So we're going to load Anaconda or Miniconda uh, to get access to the Conda tools because we're going to use MPI for Pi to get access to this MPI library. And then we're going to use MPI for Pi to um, use the standard commands that I told you about to share information in our calculation of Pi. So let's see what that looks like. First thing we we'll do is edit our calcpy.py. And here you can see the code that we wrote in a previous quick byte tutorial um, that calculates the area of each of those rectangles. So the first thing we're going to do is import the MPI for Pi library. Now, when processes are communicating with each other, um, they're all running the same code. So we're going to run the same Python code that you see on the screen on every core. But the behavior of those Python programs is going to differ depending on which core they're running on, so which process number they have. The zero um, process, that's the process with ID zero, is traditionally called root and it's going to handle printing the result at the end. So every process needs to know its, its rank. So we do that with com get rank, and that just returns the, the process ID. So it'll be zero through however many processes we're running on however many cores. So if you have 10 cores, the ranks will be zero through nine. And of course, we're interested in how many processes we're running at any one time. And we're going to get that with com get size. This tells us the size of our uh, MPI communication group. All right, so now we've got some basic information there. We've got our the rank of the process that's running. If it's the zeroth rank, we're going to call that the root. And we have the number of uh, processes that we're dealing with. And now we can just modify our for loop a little bit. So this is the for loop that we had that um, iterates over the number of rectangles that we have to calculate the area of. And as I talked about earlier, we're going to divide this for loop up among a bunch of um, processors so they each are calculating just a subset of those rectangles. The way this distributed for loop works is that the first argument to this range is the starting step. The second argument is the end step, so in this case the number of total number of steps we're going to look at. And the last argument is the stride, or how many steps do we skip. Um, when I say steps here, this corresponds to the rectangle. So if I am um, the second process, that means my rank is 1, so I'm going to start looking at the first rectangle, not the zeroth rectangle, but the first rectangle, and I'm going to calculate um, the area of that rectangle. Then I'm going to skip how many processes there are, so if there are 8 processes, I'll skip 8 of those rectangles, and then calculate the ninth rectangle in this case. And I'll keep on doing that, I'll keep on repeating. Um, calculating the area of a rectangle, skipping how many rectangles there are processes, until I get up to the maximum number of rectangles, which is our num steps. And if all the other processes are doing exactly the same thing, and they're each skipping by how many processes there are, we'll end up calculating all the rectangles, and we'll have evenly divided the work among all the processes. All right, now that we've written an MPI program, we can take a look at how to actually run it. So we're using um, MPI 4 Pi. Uh, that's the libraries that Python uses. But there are lots of other libraries you can use for MPI. So if we take a look at OpenMPI, for example, we can see that there are a large number of different uh, available modules. 
These modules are um, mainly divided up by compiler. So if you weren't writing in Python, you were writing in C or Fortran, you might want to match the version of um, OpenMPI or MPish is the other big MPI um, distribution. So the first thing we're going to do is load the Miniconda environment. So I can say module avail Miniconda. And there's the name of that module. And that gives me access to the conda command. And I can now install the MPI for Pi library. Uh, if you're not familiar with conda environments, refer to the previous Quick Byte video on uh, conda environments um, in the same playlist. All right, so we're going to say conda create dash n, let's call it MPI Quick Byte. And we're going to install the MPI for Pi package. This is what we're looking for. Here's the MPI and the MPI for Pi packages. So I see that we have one um, debug node available. So I'm going to create an interactive job so we can play around with running our parallel version of CalcPy. I'm asking for one node with eight cores here. So let's cd into the workshop directory. And the first thing we have to do is load our Miniconda and then load our conda environment. And let's just quickly verify that we do have access to our MPI for Pi library. We do, so we can exit. And let's try running our parallel program. Oops, and it wants argument, let's tell it to look at um, a million steps. That took uh, about a fifth of a second. Now let's try running it um, in parallel. So running it like this, the usual way with Python calc pi dot pi, just runs it on one core. We don't get any of the benefit of having multiple cores available. To do that, we need to use MPI run. So MPI run is part of the MPI system. And we're going to say with this MP argument that we want to run on eight CPUs. Actually, what we're saying is we want to create eight processes. It's important to match the number of processes to the number of CPUs available. Um, if you create too many processes, let's say you've created 20 processes, uh, but only had two cores, then 10 of those processes would all be trying to fight over one core. That's called oversubscribing. It's something we see quite a bit, and it actually will end up um, slowing down your code rather than making it faster. All right, so let's run our CalcPy MPI version on eight processes with eight CPUs on this node. Oops. this typo and give it a number of steps. We gave it a million before. Let's do that again. All right. So before it took a fifth of a second. This time it took just three hundredths of a second. So we did speed up our program significantly by using those eight cores in MPI. Um, again, I know I've said this before, but this is just a toy example. Typically what we see is a program that takes um, a day to run and then you divide it across 10 cores and now you're just running it um, in a matter of a couple of hours. And as usual, our next step 
is to create a PBS um, file so we can submit these jobs to the scheduler rather than doing it interactively. Oops. So here is the um, here is the PBS script we wrote previously. For uh, the serial version of this job, we're going to modify this now to use um, MPI. Actually, this is the one I guess we used for our parallel, embarrassingly parallel version. So let's change its name to MPI. We're going to module load Miniconda again. And I'm just repeating the steps that we used in the interactive session. I'm going to leave this parallel line here just for a moment. Um, we're going to compare the arguments from, between parallel and MPI run. So we say MPI run and P. And to make sure it matches the, um, the number of processors that we were allocated, I'm going to use a PBS variable here. Here's a list of the PBS provided environment variables. Um, PBS or Workter, you're already familiar with from our previous Quick Byte. Uh, PBS num ppn tells you how many CPUs did you ask for per node. But what we want to look at is PBS np. So this tells me how many um, execution slots. So that's the number of nodes times the number of cores that I asked for per node. And that's what we want to use for MPI. All right, so we're going to say MPI NP and then pass in this PBS NP argument. Now, recall from our parallel, GNU parallel quick byte that we had to pass in this SSH login file. Uh, PBS node file. So the PBS node file tells the, the program what are the names of the other nodes that we might be using. Now, um, right now, if we're using two, we're going to have at least two compute nodes. And so we're going to have to tell MPI run what the names of those compute nodes are so we can access them. And the syntax is much the same. I'm going to say machine file and then use this PBS node file again. So I hope you're already seeing that in the world of parallel uh, systems, this PBS node file is sort of a standard format that goes into tools like GNU Parallel and MPI Run. All right, and then we can pass in the name of the program we want to run. And the number of iterations we want to use. Let's take a look at 10 million here. All right. So we're going to run our MPI version of CalcPy on a total of 16 cores, two nodes with eight cores each. And we're going to divide up this million iterations, this calculation of a million rectangles, evenly among those 16 cores. All right, so we're about ready to submit this. Um, one thing that you'll notice is I changed where it had conda activate to source activate. So it's a little bit of a, a wrinkle in the implementation of conda. Um, because we're running this non-interactively, we have to say source activate 
not conda activate. Source activate is actually the older way of doing it, um, and it's compatible with um, non-interactive sessions. All right, let's give that a try. So we're going to say q sub calc pi dot pbs. To watch our job run kind of quick. There it is. All right, so it's running on two nodes, 16 cores. Let's see. So the output is going to be in. So it took us 0.14 seconds to run um, on 10 million steps. Let's modify that slightly. What I'm going to do here is change this to just run on one process. So even though we've allocated 16 cores, I'm just going to, as a test, run it on one process. And we'll see how long that takes. So again, even though we have two nodes allocated and 16 cores, I've only asked for one MPI process. So it should be the same or similar to our serial version. All right, let's take a look at the output. All right, so with one core, it took um, 1.8 seconds. And with our 16 cores, it took 0.14 seconds. All right, so that's um, how to use MPI to uh, parallelize jobs so they run faster when you need to have communication between the different processes that are um, calculating the solution to whatever problem you're, you're working on. Before we end, let's take a look at a couple of examples of PBS scripts that we've written for users at Carsey. Mr. Bayes is a um, phylogenetic reconstruction program and you can see here on the last line of the PBS script that it uses MPI run, passes the number of processes, and uses the machine file to figure out what nodes have been allocated for this job. Similarly, um, RaxML is another phylogenetic reconstruction program and um, works on very large data sets, so spreading that computation across a large number of nodes is important. And in phylogenetics, the reconstruction is coupled, so there has to be communication between the different parts, uh, the different processes, in order to figure out what the right tree to create is. And so MPI is commonly used. And lastly, uh, the Atomic Toolkit that's used for analyzing nanoscale objects and substances. Um, also very computationally intensive and exploits MPI. Behind the scenes, these three programs all use similar commands to the ones we used in our uh, parallel CalcPy program, um, where they communicate information between processes. All right, so um, MPI is powerful. It can decrease the computation time significantly for a lot of applications. And uh, I hope this tutorial has been useful, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.